Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm Sebastian. Um, I have like two hats on. On the one hand, I'm professor for computer security and cryptography at Flensburg University. This is uh, quite uh, north of Germany, cl very close to the uh, Danish border. And I'm also the CTO of uh, Enclave, which is developing uh, open source tools for confidential compute. And um, I have been in the space of confidential compute, li compute literally my whole business life. So everything started with uh, my journey as a PhD. This is where you know I went down the rabbit hole as a cryptographer in particular. And this talk is a bit like yeah a summary of my journey, how uh, I ended up in what people call today confidential compute. So it's more like a high level introduction to confidential compute. And my personal goal is to um, at least convince some of you that confidential compute might really be the next say, software and development paradigm. Um, this talk is a bit longer uh, because a friend of mine, Arvid, uh, unfortunately um, couldn't attend today, so I'm taking over also some of uh, his slides. Um, and if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to interrupt because, uh, as Luca told me uh, some minutes ago, we have enough time to discuss. And I think this is important because confidential compute is, as mentioned, a very cool paradigm. And I would really be happy if you also share this opinion after uh, the uh, talk with me. So um, let's start um, confidential compute. So people say it solves a 14 years um, open problem. Um, at least cryptographers do that because uh, Ron Rivers, VR and RSA, you know, famously claimed more than 40 years ago, if we could compute on encrypted data, that would be magnificent. And uh, confidential compute is solving this grand challenge um, of computing on encrypted data, as uh, cryptographers, uh, cryptographers would say that, with more an engineering and less than a say mathematical approach, you know, which is typically based on complexity assumptions. Um, developers, on the other hand, would say confidential compute is a technology that for the very first time allows us to isolate applications from the infrastructure. Yeah? And this is, I think, um, also quite cool because it opens up a lot of opportunities how we can at least securely deploy uh, the software we develop. And the nice thing is, and uh, this, is, this is already you know, um, um, something looking ahead, with confidential compute, literally we as developers have to do nothing. You know, and for such a powerful security technology, say the performance overheads is almost negligible. And this is also sensational because you know we as cryptographer back in the days used to work with fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation. You know, maybe as, uh, you guys are familiar with the concepts. And uh, whatever we tried to do um, had always a significant performance penalty. Computational compute doesn't uh, bring that. Um, and uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, whenever you know I, I talk about uh, confidential compute, what you always can you know try to think uh, in your head is, it's about creating black boxes, um, black boxes or blind boxes. So we can put any code, any data, in that box. You know, typically people call it an enclave. Um, and whatever happens in that um, box is shielded and protected against uh, the outside. And how, it, uh, how that works technically, you know, I'm going to um, tell about that um, later. Um, but just bear in mind, black box, blind box, I'm going to use those terms uh, interchangeable. Yeah, and um, here comes literally the only prerequisite in order to activate confidential compute. Yeah. We need standard CPUs. That's it. Yeah. 
So uh, here is a list of um, um, pro processor series from, from Intel, AMD, ARM is also working on that, NVIDIA is working on that, there is also work uh, in the RISC-V uh, community. Um, and the whole idea of confidential compute is take an existing CPU and put a security processor into this CPU. So um, it's somehow an evolutional technology in comparison to TPM-based technologies. Uh, Leonard, for example, uh, had a talk uh, yesterday about TPM and Linux. Uh, uh, we could also think that uh, the security processor is like the next evolvement of TPM technology with the difference that it's no more a standalone chip, but this power of the crypto processor is now on the sock of a standard uh, Intel AMD ARM CPU. Um, and all we just need is, of course, a bit drivers, you know, s certain, say, s software add-ons and, and kernels and so on, such that um, this security processor is enabled. That's literally it. And um, if we have that, the question is, of course, why do we need it? Um, and I think the killer use case and also the timing is right for this technology. Um, it's cloud. So everything is cloud. Uh, my hypothesis is, um, say, most of the software uh, in the future will be deployed in the cloud. Um, and we know that the cloud is about sharing resources, uh, sharing infrastructure. And we also know that the way, at least clouds are uh, architectures these days, um, you know, leak workload by default. Yeah, so for example, the cloud service provider, you know, who administrates the infrastructure sees everything uh, what your workload is. And we can, of course, imagine that there are plenty of use cases, in particular in a world where AI, where, where data is, is like dominating, it makes sense to somehow shield your data, your workload, your code. Um, so, um, confidential computing comes to rescue here, um, because uh, with the help of that uh, security processor, we can radically change our security model. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mentioned before that say there are say two paths um, of the security pro processors. There is say the SGX path, which allows to enclave at the level of an application or a container, and then uh, there are the other technologies like AMD Ceph, um, which um, allow to enclave at the level of uh, virtual machines. Um, and through the enclavation, through the ability to create the black box, uh, suddenly the security model changes as mentioned. And what does that mean? Um, you know, what you see on the um, illustrations on the right, this is, you know, a standard um, simplified uh, cloud architecture where you, for example, have a host operating system a hypervisor and then you try to virtualize your workload. Um, and say my whole academic career was always defined upon the assumption that you always have to trust your base. And the base is, of course, you know, the whole code that runs underneath your application. But with confidential compute, we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, because we create now an enclave, say, around a virtual machine. So this is uh, something like a black box around the virtual machine. And anything underneath can be corrupted, can be malicious. Yeah? Um, so I don't have to trust, say, the infrastructure provider anymore. And this is, I think, a significant great, a great breakthrough. Um, because as a security guy, you know, I, for example, can now um, get a security so a solution, uh, which, you know, well, we'll see later, it's very easy to implement, um, gives, you know, a lot of security, um, and protects my data without, you know, for example, caring, do I have to trust uh, the underlying um, host operating system underneath? And that was, as mentioned in the past, a fundamental assumption. Yeah. 
Um, what does that mean concretely? You know, for example, let's consider you know uh, the VM-based enclavation empowered through, say, Intel DDX or AMD Ceph, and let's uh, consider a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you know, I could, for example, enclave now my node. Yeah, put uh, say my code into that uh, node, run it as usual, and anything which runs say next to the node or underneath the node could be potentially corrupted. The technology just makes sure that whatever you know, happens underneath or aside doesn't really impact the execution um, of my code, my process, my program. Um, if we would even uh, go further towards application or enclavation at um, um, application layer, like Intel SGX offers that, we could even you know, shield uh, our application at the level of a pod. Yeah? So even if I, for example, uh, run a cluster uh, with multiple nodes um, and um, run maybe you know, a single um, pod uh, in the node, you know, this pod would be shielded against uh, neighboring malicious um, pods. Got it. Um, Questions so far? So your trust still needs to go somewhere. In this case, it's not on the at the software level anymore, but it's in the implementation of the security chip itself, right? So how can we sure that uh, those vendors that are getting a monopoly? <laughs> Yeah. They don't have um, a backdoor implementation of a security chip. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. People ask me a lot. Um, and my, my argument, but this is my personal one, is um, today there is a fundamental um, say assumption of uh, how we trust computing. Namely, um, it's the CPU, right? This is, say, the only say, assumption we have to do, and think about we're running any fancy cryptographic algorithm, right? Um, even this algorithm needs to trust the CPU because the CPU is in charge for you know, computing the mathematic, mathematical operations. The CPU is in charge for, for rendering uh, uh, sampling randomness. Yeah? So we're still you know, relying on the trust of the CPU to provide the right micro-instructions. Yeah? And for security um, extensions, you could think about adding just 15 to 18 or even some more um, instructions into the architecture of the CPU. Yeah? That's true. I just wanted to say that you have it also on the slide. We don't always trust the CPU. Uh, you have of spectre course. meltdown that happened, right? Yeah. So, and sometimes higher, level, uh, higher layers such as DOS need to work around uh, problems in the CPU design, right? And microcode is also software at the end. It is, right? Um, and I, I wouldn't say that meltdown and other you know, um, cache based attacks are, say, purposely you know, implemented in order to leave a side pack. They are just as you said, right? kind of software bugs which happen all the time and they need to be fixed, right? Um, and another argument, maybe if this doesn't convince you, is um, there are, say, two, three great CPU vendors um, in the world. If one of them, you know, uh, turns out to be having implemented this, um, somehow a backdoor, right? This is definitely the end of that business because that market is so competitive um, and the others are just waiting until one makes a significant mistake. Yeah? And I think against uh, this background, you know, in the end, right, I mean, these are commercially driven companies. If, if they make that strategic move, you know, they would ruin their business. So before the next question, I have another argument, I think, as an Azure guy. So before this, you had to trust the CPU and Microsoft and AWS. With this, you just trust the CPU. It's not perfect, but it's much better. It's an argument I like. Um, so, the one, so the one thing that I, I'm kind of curious about is, especially in this model where you are trying to protect the container, the container is 
at least in the current way of programming things, inherently doing all sorts of syscalls. So, for example, if you take a project like Gvisor, but you make a malicious version of that that intercepts your syscalls, what's there to stop anything from doing that? You've still got to provide, essentially trust your infrastructure provider not to be completely malicious. Um, unless you're proposing that we're basically executing a second kind of kernel thingy on the, within the enclave that can also do all kinds of I.O. Um, regarding I.O., there is, there is ongoing work um, how to also uh, secure the communication. Uh, for example, AMD recently uh, published uh, TIO, Trusted I.O., that goes a bit in this direction. And uh, where I de definitely are with you is the fact that whatever we put now in the enclave, of course, is now our responsibility. Yeah? Um, for example, if we consider the VM-based enclave and we put, say, a full-fledged, um, non-verified you know, um, uh, guest operating system with, you know, I don't know, a kernel no one uh, has scrutinized so far, then it's somehow our responsibility if, if that code is malicious, if there are backdoors. Yeah? But uh, my point is that, um, I mean, this technology is, uh, has always to be uh, adjusted to the use case, right? And for, uh, say, high security use cases, maybe you really want to have the TCB as small as possible of that enclave, so SGX might be the right choice. But for a lot of applications, you know, you're just fine with, you know, uh, controlling what is in your VM, yeah? Because, you know, you have a lot of uh, universality, generality, and uh, ease of use with that approach. And this way, for example, always, you know, somehow, yeah, balance the security versus, say, performance and usability you want to have. This, is, this has been always something like the, the, the trilemma, you know, in my past whenever I came up with security innovation. Yeah? Got it. Um, so I, I think now is a good moment to give you guys a small demo because I personally believe uh, always that seeing is believing. Yeah. So I created, uh, you know, uh, with a team some uh, videos. You can go to the, uh, our YouTube channel uh, at Confidential Compute or uh, through GitHub. You're going to find the link to that, where we have created a series of demo videos how enclavation technology works. Um, I'm now going to show you two examples. Uh, one example is Redis. Uh, Redis was in-memory database, um, and what we want to uh, see is that we're going to do a memory dump of Redis after writing a uh, key value um, in, into the database. And then we're going to do the memory dump. And in the non-enclaved version, of course, we're going to see uh, what we entered. In the enclaved version, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to see what we wrote before. Um, yeah. So, uh, for the orientation, the terminal to the left, bottom left, is the enclaved Docker container of Redis, and to the right um, is the non-enclaved. And as mentioned, um, uh, we're just going to write into, we're going to start the two containers, um, and then write just the key my secret into the databases. And then, uh, once we did the memory dump, we're going to search for uh, the string my secret, and hopefully the magic that we're going to see is going to be convincing. So this is a process ID. We searched for no. Let's see whether this is better. Exactly. So uh, in the dump, there was a match. And now let's do the same with the um, enclaved Redis. Yeah. So process ID 
this 9122, made the dump, and now we're going to search for the string my secret, and we see there is no uh, my secret because it's a ciphertext. Yeah? So every, everything what runs in the memory is like encrypted, so whenever we do a memory dump, we just get ciphertext, so we cannot search for uh, the plain text my secret anymore. Um, another example which goes also hand in hand with uh, the technology is, of course, uh, integrity protection. Um, and the second example I now uh, want to show to you guys is about um, a very simple Hello World kind of uh, C, um, C Sharp application, which reads from a file. Yeah, it's like a Hello World, and so uh, in this um, file, there's a paragraph from Shakespeare. Yeah, um, and we're uh, uh, we're gonna repeatedly print out uh, the text paragraph, and in the uh, the attack model, we, we wanna modify the text on the fly. So we're gonna try to modify the file on the fly, fly, and um, the non-enclaved program will, also, uh, will allow the modification, so we can change uh, the um, Shakespeare text. The enclaved execution will prevent that. Yeah, so starting the right, so the non-enclaved. So now we're attacking the non-enclaved container, and we see we, we uh, could inject a bad string. And now let's try uh, to see what happens when we do it with the enclaved container. Yeah, the container execution aborts. And the reason for that is uh, that the integrity protection, the enclavation mechanism, just figure out that you know there is some um, 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 bad hash value, and because of that, the whole enclavation execution detected that and stopped the process. So the whole idea is uh, to just show that we can not only uh, achieve the confidentiality of an enclave, but we can also um, safeguard the integrity and the authenticity of the code which runs in the enclave. That's the magic. Uh, I, I hope that those examples ha haven't been too fast. But uh, if, if you just want to reproduce them, as mentioned, go to YouTube, uh, go to GitHub, there is the whole code, there is the demo code, you can just reproduce everything. Um, cool, so um, if there are no further questions, I'm going to go over to, to the next part, uh, which is a bit more technical. How does it work? Um, and um, irrespectively, uh, whether you know we're now talking about enclavation at the container level or enclavation uh, of the VM level, the concepts uh, I'm going to now present to you are universal to both of them. The de details of the implementations vary, of course, also to the uh, security extension you use, but the high-level concepts are uh, similar. And uh, from a technical point of view, um, an enclave is black box or blind box. Um, is realized for something that we call 3D encryption. And 3D encryption stays for uh, data and transit encryption, data at rest encryption, and data and use encryption. So, yeah, or uh, putting in other words, we need to 3D encrypt, say, our process in order to get the claimed security of an enclave. 
Uh, data and transit encryption, I think uh, this is something I'm not going to dive much deeper into. It's about how can I uh, establish a secret communication channel into the uh, enclave. Typically, we do it via SSH or uh, SSL TLS. Yeah? Um, data address encryption changes a bit. Uh, because data address encryption, for example, um, is implemented uh, for disencryption in VMs, and a similar concept now comes into uh, the game. Um, but it has to be modified slightly through um, some special protocols, simply because um, we have to make sure that the key in order to encrypt or decrypt the disk is securely provisioned into the enclave. Um, and data and use encryption is then, say, the topping, which is uh, realized for memory encryption. Yeah? And um, how can you guys you know, imagine memory encryption? So uh, what you see here is also a very s simplified view. On the right, um, you see uh, a CPU architecture, which, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, a CPU architecture um, consisting of an ALU and a memory management unit. And on the left, there is now this extra superpower through the security processor. And think about that there is an uh, AS, AES engine uh, available and a secure uh, key storage mechanism. Yeah. And uh, what now happens is whenever we, for example, retrieve from a, from a memory, uh, a micro-instruction. Um, um, this micro-instruction is uh, decrypted, um, executed through the ALU, um, then re-encrypted before it's written back to the uh, memory. Yeah? Um, so just think about an encryption-decryption unit is in between uh, the CPU and the memory, and it's on the CPU dies. Um, and all now the CPU needs to know, and this is where the operating system typically helps, is to understand that, hey, this micro-instruction comes now uh, from a memory area, which is specifically re reserved for enclave processes, versus um, it's coming from a uh, memory area which is not uh, uh, reserved for enclave processes. Yeah? And this is where, you know, s some say, uh, magic or s some support with an existing uh, Linux kernel is Im implemented to just help the CPU to understand where does this microinstruction come from and is it encrypted or not. Um, then another novelty of the whole technology is um, those uh, NCLEF applications have now an identity. Yeah, so we can really now authenticate uh, the workload. And this typically works by using a feature which is called attestation. And the CPU has now the extra power that it can measure uh, the process. And uh, through the measurements, uh, it can now issue certificates. And those certificates we can now use uh, to send out to other services or other parties and authenticate the process or the code running in the process. Yeah, and this concept is quite similar to uh, attestation back uh, back in the uh, TPM specification. Um, yeah, it borrows the ideas. Yeah. Um, so, um, what we also need to understand that if now workload has identity, uh, we can use that extra information in order to define certain access policies. So think about now you have an external service. It's like a workload identity management service, which asks the CPU, please tell me, say, what is, say, the signature of that process, uh, enclave process. It can be a VM or an application. And once you have this uh, identity, you typically use uh, um, a key provisioning service. So a service which has now, for example, the disencryption key for your volume stored. Um, and you, first of all, check the identity of the VM. Um, if, if that matches the reference values, you then tell uh, the key management service, please provide the disencryption key into the enclave. 
And then uh, this, uh, um, this encryption key provisioned in the enclave could be used in order to decrypt any encrypted volume, for example, through looks or similar uh, tools. Yeah, um, and these are the, the core concepts. Yeah, any of the uh, uh, confidential compute um, hardware providers needs and um, that you effectively have to implement if you want to build confidential workload, for example, in the cloud. Yeah. Um, got it. Questions so far? Yeah, so I'm not sure if that makes sense, but from the picture with the like security chip next to the CPU that sort of acts as a like decryption and encryption mechanism between the CPU and the outer world. So on, yeah, that one. Does it mean that the application that's actually being executed needs to understand that it's running in an enclave and do some special like I don't know setup to 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 do that or does that work out of the box? Um so what we need to do is to somehow encode uh, in the application some kind of say, I call it the bit, telling literally the CPU um, this is an encrypted application or not, or an enclave application or not. Yeah? Um, and now, um, if, if you ask how you do it in practice, if you go for SGX, of course, you have to take your application and put some extra around your application in order to turn it into an enclaved, um, say, binary. In terms of uh, uh, enclaved virtual uh, machines, you don't have to do nothing because your VM, by default, is already started in such a way that your CPU knows whatever now happens in, in that, uh, say, VM memory space has to be encrypted by default. So it's kind of the, like in the VM case, it's sort of the ho uh, like most enclosed host system that sort of deals with that, or? Yeah, you okay. can say so. Thanks. Um, thank you for the talk, I find it really interesting. Um, I've been running a lot of systems, like just because I'm very paranoid and uh, I Perfect. hope I can stop this, this is your like very soon. Um, so, I have the question, like, how is it regarding performance? What are the implications? And if I understand remote attestation completely, like, could I, for example, ask, like, is the container running in the enclave just defined by my Docker file and nothing else? Very practically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like that. So, um, let's uh, start with the most interesting question, performance. So, um, going back to the table, uh, we have like say two different paths um, and SGX, say the mother of uh, confidential compute started 2015, say first approach, um, how to say enclave applications. Um, this is great if, if you want to have a small trusted computing base um, but um, what the way you typically enclave uh, an existing application is by wrapping it into a libos. Are, are you familiar with the concept libos? Yeah. So you wrap it because you would like to have, say, standardized interfaces that allow you to just uh, enclave any application. Um, and uh, the way libosses work, there are also you know, a lot of approaches, but uh, for example, those that have been uh, tailored for SGX technology try to be as lean as possible, but this means that they use a lot of kernel functionalities in order to um, um, uh, answer the syscalls. And whenever there is, say, a swap from the enclave process to, say, the, the kernel process, there is this performance bottleneck. Yeah? And because of that, SGX has, say, a performance overhead, say, for, from 1 to 20x, yeah, depending, and the answer is depending on what kind of syscalls are uh, uh, needed and how many are needed. Yeah? Um, 
then with SGX, certain applications, for example, are not enclavable at all. For example, Postgres, because Postgres uses shared memory. And the idea of shared memory conflicts with security model of SGX, because you really want to have, say, your enclave process, and it shouldn't talk to another process which shares any resources. Um, now, on the other hand, comes the VM-based approach. Um, and uh, Ceph is um, currently publicly available. Um, TDX is something we um, um, are now uh, previewing with Intel together. But there are little differences. Ceph, on the other hand, has a performance overhead of at most 2% of CPU cycles. 2%. Yeah, at most. Yeah. TDX is around, say, 4 to 6%. Yeah. Also, of course, depending a bit on applications and so on. But long story short, if you consider, say, uh, cloud-based applications um, and you, for example, trust, say, your trusted computing base you put into the VM, my recommendation is go for uh, enclave VMs and do it already now because there is no performance overhead for you right now. Yeah? So you have a VM and a VM works, a confidential VM works like a non-confidential one. You just SSH in, you put whatever you put in, into your uh, VM and it works like before. No wrapping with lib authors, no pre-compiling, no going an extra mile. It works out of the box. Yeah? Um, no performance overhead. The only thing uh, which is currently happening is that uh, hyperscalers, because they are the first that now offer, uh, say, Ceph-based and soon TDX-based um, compute, they, of course, want 10 to 20 percent more for that superpower. But uh, we, for example, work with a Berlin-based cloud provider, Crowd. Um, you literally get the same machines for 50% of that, uh, that of hyperscalers. Yeah? Um, so if price is in the end uh, a reason. Yeah? So uh, the decision now you have to fail is, uh, am I super paranoid? So do I need a small trusted computing base, a small footprint, then SGX, but to be reminded that um, performance might be growing. Um, if you wanna, uh, if you guys wanna try that out, go to our GitHub because we created like 18 out of the box ready Docker container, like Maria, Redis, uh, <laughs> Python, C Sharp, whatever you need in order to build a cloud application. They are already the uh, ready applications, and you can start working with that. Otherwise, go to one of the hyperscalers, book a Ceph-enabled uh, virtual machine, and get going. Yeah. Um, now your second question, attestation, is now an important uh, thing because uh, you really want to figure out, is my workload now really running in an enclave? So uh, there are two ways to go. Either you take, say, the attestation services that hyperscalers already provide, both for SGX and Ceph, there is something in place. Yeah. Or you do say uh, you use external um, services, for example, we have implemented Vault, we have implemented Nitride with effectively our open source component that literally allow you to run uh, your attestation and uh, key provisioning mechanism wherever you want. Yeah, you could, for example, think of, hey, I would like to have my key vault running maybe on my on-premises yeah, or in my trusted uh, zone and then just use the compute resources running in an enclave from hyperscaler. And this is also a bit the direction we from enclave work towards. Yeah? Because if you understand the concept of confidential compute, yeah, the future is now we have compute, it's enclaved, so I can run it literally anywhere I want. Yeah? So think about this super duper vision of multi-cloud computing, but now you can really even run on environments uh, in maybe less hyperscaler dominated data centers. Yeah? Uh, you have all liberty. Yeah? All you just need to do is uh, key management and workload identity management. This is the key components you have to 
rather trust, maintain, and make sure that it's somehow in your trusted belly. Yeah? And then compute becomes just a commodity. All right, I think. Yes, I think that is it. So thanks, Sebastian. Thank you. Thanks, guys.